Well, Alfred, <clears throat> um, I'm Fred Jennings from Ipswich, Mass. And I just wanted to thank you for a, a quite stirring presentation and the work you've been doing. I'm a PhD economist and uh, I'm kind of troubled by the fact that, you know, this sort of economic behavior is going on all over the world. And uh, it's having massively destructive ecological impact. And uh, it'd be interesting to hear you talk a little bit about that general problem. And I was particularly curious as to whether you think that there were money changing hands in the Liberian government that basically allowed this exploitation to occur. You're on mute. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, question. Um, um, I was also, um, you know, in 2010 when, uh, before 2010, I was actually involved in, in policy work in Liberia, uh, helping the government to put in place legislations, you know, to protect forests, to protect rights of communities. Because we came out of the war and there was a lot of work we've done. And in fact, um, by 2010, um, I was actually thinking about, you know, moving on to other things, you know, I had trained a group of young people and I was, you know, hoping they would do something and I wanted to, to go to academia to teach and I was going to do some private practice because I've been involved in a lot of work across the region. And then, you know, these concessions started to be awarded and, you know, I figured out that uh, the laws will be followed. So the first time we got a repose, I didn't believe that until I was taken out to the field to go ahead and see the destruction. And I went to a place called uh, uh, um, Gola Kone, in, in, not Gola Kone, Gaula District in Cape Mount. And when I, we, we descended from the vehicle and I got outside, they, were, they had just started clearing. And it was my first time seeing this. You know, um, I had traveled on that road and I'm from that region because my mom is from an indigenous tribe called the Vai tribes. So I was born in Cape Mount and I grew up there, went to high school and I traveled on that road. And when I returned by, it was like a completely different place on both sides of the highway, as far as the eye could see. You know, just this massive clearing. You know, just clearing. And just the bare soil you could see. So walk up to the village. And I grew up in indigenous villages. Villages are established within the heart of the forest, surrounded by the forest. But that's how the indigenous people protect themselves. They build a village in the heart of the forest, and all these clearings are like a wall protecting the Sorry village. For, uh, John, I need record permission for Anna's workshop. You know, <clears throat> and so I entered the village and they were completely clear. I mean, you look at the town and not even a spot or a zone for gardening was left. It was as far as the eye could see. And, you know, not just the forest, but the wetlands, the streams, the creek, all of that completely diverted and re-engineered to allow for the flow of water to come into the oil palm field and not into those towns and villages. Mm -hmm. So you're not just talking about the water flowing, but think about all of this, the aquatic life that exists in that water that was completely impacted. All of that flowing back into the oil palm field. So it's the forest, it's all of these species of birds and fauna and flora destroyer, it's the aquatic system that feeds into all of that, all of that. It was massive. And I was just standing and looking at, it was my first time seeing how uh, governments and companies had used engineering and science to implicate rights in the environment. When I saw that re-engineering of the flow of the water. This village, they had set up the village right by the side of the river in the stream where people could just go down and collect their water and set their baskets and collect their food and crabs. That whole flow was back into the oil pound to make sure they have uh, 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 water. 
So we're talking about the ecological impact. You can even, I mean, it's, it's unheard of. And that's what really compelled me to go. But I just what the ecological impact really was. The other thing I feel that we have not even delved into that is the emotional, social, and psychological impact. The whole idea of post-traumatic syndrome mm -hmm. indigenous people have faced from that process. Mm -hmm. This boy who got up with a lifelong who to go and farm every single day, there were trials who would just sit in the morning, they would take their tools, they would come out of their homes, and they would just sit down. And they would just stare into the sky, mm -hmm. not knowing what to do. And of course, that was they start having the whole question of insect pest infestations. The kind of uh, uh, species that were not exterminated during the destruction of the forest. I mean, birds and snakes and all of the things started finding home in those towns and villages. Folks are suffering snake boys, insect boys. Just think about what's going on. The scale of that impact is just unbelievable. Sadly, no one has really gone into ready to sit down to document all of that. But it was, and it still is, very massive. And that's what compelled us to act. Because we look at how much was being cleared. The government has given a total of almost like three to five to six million acres of forest land. The time we are going in, they are clear like 5% of that land. So we'll try to find a way to stop that. That's when we started mobilization and training. And as we're trying to hold on to this company in the northwestern part of Liberia, the government then awarded another contract with another company in the southeastern part of Liberia. We are a small institution. We had to basically divide ourselves. I would like have to drive, I remember driving up to every after work, five o'clock, because luckily the first area was not far from the city. So every single day I have to drive up. And it became a cost because growing up, you had to take your staff, you had to take driver. So we couldn't afford to pay the drivers and pay the staff who were accompanying me. So I had to make a personal decision to drive myself. So I would go up there around five, we would meet, we would talk, we would because the first thing about communities, you have to sit and spend a lot of time talking and understanding, negotiating, mm -hmm. and making sure you get that consent. We decided that they are ready to move. Mm -hmm. You know, come back late in the evening. Then when they opened to the other side in the southeastern, we had to repeat the same thing. The evidence was very massive. So yes, the ecological impact was just something you couldn't uh, uh, put your hands on to. To the extent, you know, so now don't see how that implicates ecology. People who live in the towns and villages live off nature. They won't feel wood. They walk into the forest. I did that when I was a kid. You go every day into the mountains and you take the dry woods that chop off the trees. You don't go cut the brush. You, the ones that have dried off and fall off is the one you pick and you come. So we became almost like gatherers. That whole culture of gathering was completely obliterated. People could not go and get it. In fact, they didn't have fuel. They tried now how to find, you know, to go and pay for charcoal. They had to go and pay for locally produced materials. And the homes that they were constructing, which was made out of natural things from the forest, like, you know, like the straw, like the poles, like the clay, they were harvesting. They had no more access to them anymore. So this is how we talk about the ecological impact. This is what people face. And I'm talking about how the wildlife themselves were behaving. In the evenings, you see the bats. They, have, they will come in, 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 into the fruit trees in the town. The bats were in the forest. But now they left the forest and they came to the town. And there were competition between these animals. You look up and you see the birds and the bat and the... And, and, and the hogs all struggling to find a nest in the, in the trees. Mm. You know, it was, it was in a, you, you can, you, you, I just can't describe what that side is. I witnessed that. I saw that with my own eyes in those villages where people were going through. And then the, the religious and cultural side, I don't want to talk about that. Mm. I don't want to explore that. These people believe this is their God. This is their mm. religion. This is their culture. Why did that happen? Why was that change? It's because of a conceptualization that the government and the investors had, that these people had very little civilization, that these were little people. They had little gods. 
So it's important to eliminate that God, eliminate that religion, and create a business which will civilize them. And this is what happened. So when we conceptualize indigenous people as primitives and savages and as small people mm. who are in Mancho and unable to make decisions, and we are the one who are the, you know, we play girls to come in and transform their lives and civilize them and bring development to them. This is the result, the kind of business model we have. It's that business model that view these indigenous people people who are offered us to come and, and, and save. So the religion, the things they pray for, the spirituality, the entrepreneurship they develop over time, all of that means nothing. So this is what goes to and say, what else, what else is grab? It's not just the land and the forest, it's all of these things that make the very essence of people that's taken away from them when you're involved in the sort of activities across this region. Alfred? Yeah? Um, so um, are there are there other African countries who who have had the same problem? I mean, I know there are, but are there any of those that have successfully somehow confronted the corporations and the government uh, corruption that um, that you can look to as models? Maybe <laughs> we are all on the scene. It, this this is like a crime. It's a learning crime. And we've built relationship across the region. I have colleagues in Cameroon. I have colleagues in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have colleagues in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, across the region who are struggling. It's a huge struggle to try to hold accountable this kind of business model. And so there's been some attempt, you know, like we're sort of doing. So uh, there are groups like the one I have in Liberia, in other countries, that have taken some actions. But I think what we haven't seen is how we need to organize and structure that. This cannot be piecemeal. This cannot be uncoordinated. This is what we did in Liberia. So we start something in Liberia. We attack two of the companies and we, we temporarily, what we achieve in Liberia is very temporary. We slow them down. We slow them down. It doesn't mean that they are not going to metamorphosize and come back. Mm -hmm. We slow them down. That's what we've done to buy time. So that's why the world needs to organize and mobilize. Part of what I'm doing here is creating this consciousness. So all of us who are human beings across the globe, we understand what the implications are. And that the more you see these implications, the more you see this impact, it wouldn't be like, oh, it's a very remote area in Liberia. You know, you know, that's, those are towns and villages. And what is happening in Liberia, it's happening in all these countries across Africa. It's happening in all these countries in Central America. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at a talk, I tried to address, for example, uh, deforestation, climate, climate change induced migration. I have given talks about that. So in the US, for example, or across the globe, for example, all these folks who, who travel across the Sahara and jump on a boat, these are people who have been evicted out of their home. A lot of them, it is, it's not the only cause. It's deforestation and the grabbing of the, of the forest, not only the cause, but it's a material cause. And most of them, it is a mass driver that allow these people to move across. And what happened in the end? If people move from Central America or South America and come to the US and they form caravans, you don't see how that has implicated the political economic situation in the US. It evolved a whole toxic process and a huge divide across this country. Of when is how migration, a lot of that fuel by foreign direct investment into those countries, either keep goose dumb on them or corporations taking away their forests and land, or deforestation ensuring that a great situation of drought and food insecurity, they have to find another place to go. They start coming here, and nobody wanted to come across the border. But what is happening when they come here? There's huge divisions in the U.S., xenophobic reaction, people don't want to come there. And that has implications for very politics and you know, see what's going on. So it contributes in many other ways. And now we're even seeing what the cause really is from this pandemic going across. I mean, if you have time to look at the studies, I can send the link about how these scientists were able to go back after the Ebola virus to figure out how mm -hmm. habitat destructions could be traced to the emergence of the mm -hmm. Ebola. And they did a work in Liberia, across the region. And everywhere you will see material habitat fragmentations you will see why the outbreaks were going like this were like small houses from all across, they to get into that particular region. And the slides I'll show you, you see they just ring right in the north 
western part of Liberia where that is. That's where the major concentration of deforestation occur. So these are the implications. So yes. Uh, Alfred, uh, may I interrupt? Uh, I asked a question in the chat that I wanted to, to ask verbally, um, that as an environmental rights lawyer, what courses of action would you support and recommend to stop or at least impede this sort of exploitative behavior, not only in Liberia, but everywhere it's happening all over the world. How would you approach a solution to these problems as an environmental rights lawyer? Well, the first thing is that we need to have a right-based a right, a right approach to investment and development. It's time to think about that. A what approach? What is that? A right-based approach. A, a approach that is based upon right. So, for oh, example, right. when an investment is good, rights, human rights, human mm -hmm. rights based approach. Mm -hmm. A human rights based approach is, is how we proceed with that to understand that yep. people have rights. Right? So, if you're taking an investment, you got to figure out what else are you going to harm? You know, is that going to result into displacement, <clears throat> destroying people's sacred sites, destroying people's religion, destroying people's natural resources? Have they been consulted? Did you obtain their consent? So that for me could be the basis. And then how do you view these people when investment come in? So I, I had this question, for example, in, uh, in Liberia. So they, they say they, those who come from abroad and bring in the money and bring in the financing and the technology are the investors, right? That's why it, it looks like. And when they come out, they, do, they take everything. They go to the towns and villages and they cohoot with the government, they take everything. But no one consider the value that is in those communities. And what the development is. So if you went ahead and you, and you destroyed that forest, who's done evaluation of the asset that forest bring mm -hmm. that you're going to replace that with a mining operation or an mm -hmm. oil pump operation? Who's done the human rights impact assessment? Who's mm -hmm. done the environmental assessment to figure out that when you cut down a tree, what is that value? What is this total value compared to what it is? Ecological and, yeah. Ecological economics. Yes. Who's done this assessment yep. to figure yep. what it is? Mm -hmm. And how are those investments internalized to ensure that they inform the investment to know whether or not this is not what we should pursue? So we have to go back and look at the model of investment. This model investment that view nature as a commodity is mm -hmm. the one that results in these human rights issues here. But if you mm -hmm. did the human rights impact assessment, it's going to be very clear to you that, for example, happening in Liberia, you now have proceeded. Because, for example, what price tag do you put on when people say this river is their culture, is their God? What price tag do you put on when this forest mm -hmm. is the largest green fortress in West Africa that is in the way a wall preventing the encroachment of the Sahara Desert? What price do you put on that? Mm -hmm. Not just for Liberia, but across the globe. That mm -hmm. because of this forest is generating all of these uh, uh, evapotranspiration and rain clouds that distribute mm -hmm. water, that distribute water across the entire region and even beyond Africa. Mm -hmm. What price do you put on that? What price do you put on that when this forest is the largest carbon sink that is cleaning up our mess and absorbing all the carbon we are producing? What price do you put on that? And that should link up to the sort of human right any ecological assessment you would do that will inform this investment. So the investor mm -hmm. has to internalize those issues here. And this way is the environmental right approach, putting rights at the heart of investment that mm -hmm. makes it people central. Because what is happening in essence? What have we seen? Look at this investment. I show you the slides of this brand. Look at these brands. Mm -hmm. Just look at them. Take your time and watch that slide of the brand. How many companies own those brands? Maybe two or three. Five. <laughs> exactly. Own those brands. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you doing? Five. You are not just going ahead and, and, and growing rubber. You are also grabbing wealth and concentrating wealth in the hands of the few. Well, it, it, of the few. Yeah, it as, an, as an economist, it always strikes me that you know, one of the big underlying problems with this sort of behavior in general terms is that we've been taught to think about things 
in sort of separate pieces as if they were independent mm. of mm. all of the other consequences and that uh, one of the solutions or potential solutions is to start really trying to our best to look at the big picture and and mm -hmm. look at things from a more holistic and system systems orientation and that would make a big difference if people mm -hmm. could incorporate such a such an approach or such a view yeah we've got to get rid of the reductionist mindset first yeah yeah Alfred, I, I, I had two questions. One, um, is your opinion of the rights of nature movement, how significant and how much effort do you think should go into that? And also, um, there's, a, there's a growing, at least academic awareness that the people who are managing the land in the way that are protecting the biodiversity are indigenous peoples. And there have been some general popular articles that have come out too, but I think in terms of uh, bringing respect to the indigenous peoples for the wisdom and their leadership and their understanding of uh, what's truly involved in protecting ecosystems. Are you aware of that? And do you see that as a growing awareness that can help in this fight? <laughs> You know, um, <clears throat> uh, my real education in my universities where I have learned uh, folk, my professors, you know, at, at the indigenous world I work with, the things that I have learned, I'm able to speak up and speak up my mind. I learned that from my work with indigenous people. They are my professors. That is the university. They taught me these things I'm telling you about, the things I'm explaining how people live with nature, how to preserve the forest, how to preserve water. I spent, when I, I, I went to Tulane Law School, I graduated and I went back in 2004. And I started doing this work. I went, going across Liberia, across the region and meeting tribes. I mean, walking distances. And most of my colleagues who were lawyers were like, are you crazy? Are you something wrong with you? You know, but I was learning so much from this process that someone asked me like, you know, um, you know uh, do you agree that indigenous are the best? Of course, yes. Let me tell you this, Paula. So right now we talk about the science. Oh, there's global warming. And how is that linked to? It's linked to us taking the carbon and taking the resources out of the ground. It's linked to us destroying the forest. Centuries ago, who said that? Was it scientists? It was indigenous people who said, do not take the oil. Just leave my forest. Do not destroy the forest. Do not take the oil out of the ground. Mm -hmm. They were telling us. They knew why. Yeah. We felt that we, like I said before, they were primitive people who felt knew nothing. How could they tell us not to extract the oil when this could civilize our society and create jobs and create wealth? No one listened to them. All of a sudden now, we say it is a sign, but they said that centuries ago. So yes, they are very critical and very pivotal to preservation of life. And that's why I am talking about when we look at alternative, we must invest in the things that they develop. I don't think we start doing that yet. I'm not too sure we have been able to go in and sit down and clean the words out of our ears and listen to them and hear the things that they are proposing. Mm -hmm. So we need to do that. And of course, your question about the rights to nature. You know, I started teaching some of that with my students. If we, if we, humankind, are given a, a concept, a concept, legal personality, that I say a concept, that's why a corporation is. A corporation is a concept, it's an idea. If we took an idea and we gave it a legal personality, if we took a vessel, a ship, and gave it a legal personality, what about the trees? What about the forest? What about the rivers? What about the landscape that are living, that are ensuring our survival? 
What is the question on showing that they are juristic persons? Because there's no way how we can link with all them. And I think for me, the last four or five months in 2020 and you know, December 2019 with this pandemic, it's telling us what nature is saying. That it has a brain, <laughs> it thinks, and it's instructing us that what we need to do. Who's ever been able to tell him or kind to stay in house and shut everything down? You know, in all of the mankind adventures around the world, all of the wars we fought, there's now been a time where the entire planet was completely shut down. Nature has shut us down. Mm -hmm. And we say, no. Yeah. We shouldn't listen to it. No. So I believe in the right of nature. Alfred, do you, do you see, I mean, the, the changing the economic paradigm and the rights-based uh, based approach sounds wonderful, but, you know, it's hard to imagine these corporations um, actually doing anything in that regard. Do you see any political possibilities of, of governmental change or any, is there any movement to actually bring in a government that understands what, uh, what you're talking about? Any well, possibility? Well, they, they, they are not going to listen. I know that. But you know we're going to, to pay the price. So we're paying the price now. And they're all, yeah, they're all getting money, we, right? We, 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 we print out TD trade on data to bail out and counting, not just in the U.S., but look across the globe. Look what happened to businesses. They all completely shut down, right? So we have to decide <clears throat> whether we want to survive on this planet and make the appropriate adjustment, or whether we want to allow for business as usual. No one is talking about, let's go back to what was normal. Come on, hell, we've never had anything normal. How do you go back to a time where 1% of a population control more than 60% of the wealth? Is that normal? Where the disparities, massive poverty, billion of people at the bottom of the poverty level can't afford to have food, can't afford to have home, can't afford to have housing, where the, the, the planet is plagued with climate change and scientists have given us a couple of years. If we don't do anything, we are all going to face massive consequences. I mean, that is not normal. And businesses have to understand it. And I think we, the people, we, the people, must act. Because I think most often we sit down and like, well, we have to wait for government. Yeah, 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 it's what has happened over time. And I can tell you clearly that. So over time, we, are, we fool ourselves, right? We believe, we believe we have a system for choosing our leaders. So election time come, and we all go and we vote, right? We think we're voting the leaders. But who pay for these leaders? Who sponsor them? Who cover their costs? It's corporations. They fund these elections. They put forward these candidates. We go and we figure out we're making a choice. We believe. We really make believe we're making a choice, and we like this leader. But then they become very accountable to the corporations. They only put up policies that favor the corporations and not us. We have to change that. It's time to rethink not just the economic model. It's time to rethink the governance, the political, the rule of law model. There are things that we figure out were standard. They're completely now obsolete. We cannot rely on them anymore. For example, the whole construction of property rights. The whole idea of fee simple. That whole construct of a recentric fee simple. We have to rethink that process. We have to rethink governance. Because it hasn't worked. It has worked. How is it possible for the 1% to control 65% of the world wealth? Think about that. You don't need a racket scientist to tell you that there's something materially wrong with how we as humans have governed ourselves. So there's something wrong about that model. That has to be retaught. The governance, the political, the economic, we have to put everything back on the table and begin a new conceptualization of how we're going to show that there is all this adequate distribution. And we see some of that and we act that like we don't see it. So in the US, what's happening now? The pandemic has shown the disparities. It's showing the fault lines. It's showing exactly what everything went so wrong about us. And we still feel, well, you know, governments, you know, won't do that. So we now, as the people, have to act. Because it has to be the cross. But we now realize that if someone, if you destroy a forest and someone eat the wildlife and that person gets sick, 
I'm going to get sick, no matter where I am. So we are all very linked. And so we have to act together collectively to resolve it. Because why? We have the power. What has seen happen is that we as the people have not been able to utilize our power. And this is what we need to do. So, so Alfred, this question um, has been on my mind. You created an organization in Liberia yeah. that connected tribal groups, indigenous groups that perhaps may not have really been in contact with each other before. Yeah. Is that something that is possible to happen in other countries in Africa or is there absolutely. something unique about Liberia? No, we absolutely, we're doing that. So for example, we connected that. When we started making some success story, I will tell you, we started doing some work across the region. Currently, we've set up the same movement in Sierra Leone, in Guinea, in mm -hmm. Ghana, in Ivory Coast, in the Côte d'Ivoire. So there's a platform called the MRUCSO platform. And we link that to a team of young lawyers that we are training called the Public Interest Law Network for West Africa, who are working together. We bring this network. We're trying to grow this regional network and hopefully an African network and hopefully a global network. But this is, we, this is the, 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 the song that we are in this boat together. You just can't say, I'm going to solve this problem in Liberia and then leave the rest of the across the other countries. Oh, we all have to work together. So we're driving this movement across the globe. So currently, as I said here in the US, my daytime job is really spending hours in the night talking to colleagues, you know, in Sierra Leone and helping them to consolidate and build this movement across. Because I really believe that it's only when the movement, the people center, that we can now confront all of these things we're talking about. That we can bring about a change we want to, that we want to bring. From the bottom up, from the bottom up, this is what we really need. So we, we're doing some of that across the region. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but we start doing some of that. And we need to have more investment, more support to grow uh -huh. that global movement. Uh -huh. But it's the only way how we're going to change these things here. It's not going to be changed. You know, I can give all the speeches I want to give today. I can write all the articles I want to write today. I can do all the publications I want to do today. But until you put people in the street, and you organize and you mobilize, and then you go into court. Now we have cases in Sierra Leone where the laws are going to court and the people are coming there in their numbers and standing up Good. and challenging the judges to ensure that the judges are accountable. Even in a system where the rule of law is not being adhered to. So we're trying to shift that paradigm. Mm -hmm. And this is what the struggle is because the government realized what that power is. When we filed a complaint before the round table and we forced the companies to go to the villages and sit with the people to talk to them, mm -hmm. it was a threat to the government. I can tell you, it was my first time seeing ministers protesting. The ministers protested. They came to the village and they were banking boxes and knocking on the doors and said, we're not going to allow you to talk. It was funny because we shifted the power dynamics. We had the government protesting, stopping us from having a conversation with the corporations. I have not seen anything like that in my life. <laughs> but why? We shifted that power. And this is exactly what we need to do across the globe. We need to take charge. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that cooperation will not kept out our governance systems. And of course, you see across the globe, what is more representing a poster child for corporate capital across the globe? Look at leaders from the US across other countries. Anywhere you see the mighty cooperation in charge of our government, mm -hmm. in charge of our government. And this is what the problem really is. So, so, so Alfred, I'm guessing that um, I'm inferring that that you are only a proponent for um, nonviolent civil disobedience. Yep. Yep. Is it because uh, I want to right now? I want to go to Liberia with a machete to help you. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I you know, I'm a nonviolent proponent. I, I figure out. We use the law, and I'm a lawyer. I went to law school to do just that. And I've tried to get, because, you know, violence begets violence, yeah. you know. And I, we don't want to get that. We want to show that we are better people, but we have our numbers. And if we yeah. show our numbers, we can win. Okay. 
We can win. And we've seen that. Remember last year for the communities? The president, let me tell you this, the president went to the villages. She went there. The president of the Republic of Liberia went to the villages and said to the poor, I brought your investment. I'm going to do this. Don't listen to that lawyer. Mm. The people said no to the president because they knew that their interest where it was. Five years, they complained, they complained, and no one came to them. They just saw the companies coming in, clearing their land and taking them. All of a sudden, they saw us acting together in tandem, and we stopped the corporation. And the, the executive flew from abroad to come to Liberia. I went to the village to talk to them. The president now come and say, no, don't talk. You know, I am your president. I will intercede on your behalf. They're like, no, he did not intercede. Mm -hmm. So they didn't succeed. So we need to mobilize in a very non-violent way. Because we can't, that's what they're doing. We can't play the corporate game. Mm -hmm. So they believe in like violence. That? We can't play that game. We can't play that game. They want us to do that. We can't play that game. Is there an organization or a place where if, if I send your video around to my friends and they want to learn more and suppose they want to give money uh, to support you, is there an organization where you would send us? Oh, sure. Um, there's Green Advocate, the one that's based in Liberia. I can they, say they, that again. It's Green Advocate International. We had a website, but the website was a hack and destroyed. We're trying to rebuild our website. So we don't have a Facebook account. It's called the website was completely breaking down. Green Advocates International. Green, G R E E N, yeah, A D V O C A T E S, international, is based in Liberia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you type that into, someone type that into the chat. I got it. Okay, and Alfred, what is the what were those initials standing for? M R U C or M R V C? The regional. Oh, so um, we, it's a regional network. It's called our, our it's called the Manor River Union Civil Society Resource Rights and Governance oh. Platform. I will send that to you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Green Africa International. I just send that there. So I'm there. Mm -hmm. uh, Iona Connor asked in the chat. Uh, uh, she doesn't have a mic, so I'm her mic. Uh, she wants to know if she can post your video on her Facebook yes. page. Yes. Yeah, I'll get it out here too, because we're constantly talking about the consumer, the buying signals against palm oil, and it seems so insufficient when you've got only, you know, 20,000 people not buying whatever, you know, creamer for their coffee. It, it's got to be, it's, that's only the awareness and the education part of this thing. And then we've got to get to the larger aspects of governance and, um, and get our, I think, to get our own um, representatives involved as well. I think that has to happen. Mark, what's your organization? Um, I'm actually working with Drawdown, uh -huh. uh, Pachamama Alliance. This is why what Alfred's talking about is very applicable to South America as well. Um, so mm -hmm. but we're bringing everything to the local level. Uh, land use and water and respect and we've got indigenous people here who were taken over in 1600. I mean that this hasn't changed in in hundreds of years. So we're still fighting for everyone's you know that you talked about food being a basic and water being a basic. This is a rights issue Alfred I totally agree. This is a rights a human rights issue and you cannot do for one without the other. Yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not difficult for folks to see what that really is. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, when you go to a village and these people for decades have gone to their streams and rivers and live off it mm -hmm. and have clean drinking water, mm -hmm. it just flows in naturally. Mm -hmm. Then you have this big, this, this big corporation coming with the support of the government and re-engineer that flow and you deny the people safe drinking water because you want to water the oil palm plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't understand. I mean, just the humanity in you to tell you that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this is completely wrong. And then these people who were once respected farmers, entrepreneurs, who would get up every single day, they would go and care for their family. 
They have their children. They will go and get her and they will bring it and they will sell and they have enough to take care of their family and feed them. And when they are sick, care for them. So I have a situation where for in the place where there were 3,000 persons who live, who live in the community. And the government said, oh, we're going to create jobs. This, there were 3,000 farmers. The company could only hire 750. 750. So what happened to the, the 2,250? Mm. Where do they go? Their source of income completely taken off. I mean, just, mm. just about the economic part. Mm. But imagine what they did every day. They would get up, they would go to the sacred site, they would pray, they would worship. Mm. They took that embodiment, that very essence, take him up from them. Mm. And you're like, oh no, you know, that's fine. We're trying to do, develop this area. We want to build an infrastructure. We want to generate revenue. At, on, 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 on whose cause? On, 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 on why? So I, I, I said, I, you know, I told someone, like, imagine if you are going to Rome and going to attack the Catholic Church. Think about that. Or you go to the, 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 the Hindu temple and you break it down. I mean, just think about it. Just think about what, what the implications will be across the world. Think about the revolt. But that will attract. You wouldn't get away with it. You wouldn't get away with it. Yes. It's very simple. You know? And we're like, oh no, you know, uh, you guys are just like, you know, uh, you are a radical activist, you just want to, uh, to ensure these people live in poverty. These people live well and they want to grow. So if you want to help them, you go, you sit, you talk, and figure out how you can innovate that. We are currently involved in, we're trying to organize something because we want to showcase. We want to showcase that indigenous people are able to innovate and grow. When I did this work, you are someone asking about, you know, about the indigenous people. The chiefs took me into the forest, a particular place in Sino, a place called uh, 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 Buto. So after like three years, I worked with them. The chief said, you know, I want to show you something one day. Let's go. And we walked for like three, four hours into the heart of the forest. This is a place where you go in and it's like, Midday, the sun is high up the tropical place, and beneath it's almost like dark, completely closed canopy. I mean, I can't describe that. <laughs> the trees are like giants arising out of the ground. And you look at it like no one has ever been there. And the chief took me and said, Our ancestors once lived here and they showed this place. Come, let's go. And we'll go and he pointed, you see, look, you see here, this is a remnant of an old village. And you have no idea who ever lived there. And he's showing me, yeah, this is the Kola, the Kola nut tree. It stayed there. The Kola nut tree is there and is surviving in a primary forest, mm. proving that it won't bend there. And he was able to show me, we talk about ecological zones. He was able to show me the historical zones in the forest. Yes, why the people came originally. Yeah, why they stay. Yeah, why they move. Yeah, why they move. Yeah, why they move. And all along that process, as we walk, you show me even areas where there were old footpaths. You were going beneath the tree and like say, this was a footpath. And you show me that how the people once lived in those areas and how they move and how they were able to preserve that forest. And I was astounded to believe that in a place like this, it was one inhabitant of people who preserved that area. And they move alone. And these people are aware of that. And he took me to say, I'm educating you because you come and using your tools as a lawyer to help us. So I want to show you that this is how we live in this forest. That this is us. He said, the forest is us. And we are the forest. You can divorce us from it. So when you attack the forest, you're attacking people. You're attacking Tinubu, you're attacking the forest. And so for folks to say, oh, well, you know, we need to grow, you know, we need to feed people. And there's a whole question about how do we feed the growing world population? Where these people have lived and they're growing up, the increasing population, and they still kept feeding themselves. These are not the folks who go about asking they need food security. They are sustainable in the things they do just from gathering. I grew up in villages. And we went into the forest and we did a lot of gathering. Things that we needed to survive, things that we didn't need. 
So this massive industrialized operation, you know, is to me is the reason why that is contributing to the, the unsustainability process that we need to find a way to address. And I can I feel that there's a way around that. It's a way around of trying to meet the growing population of the world and still providing food and fiber to them with all the strength what we have. There has to be a way around. How do we survive? And we can say some of that. I mean, look what this massive industrialization has created. West, I mean, I'm in the US. See how much food we throw away. Mm-hmm. See how much food we throw away. So how can we talk about where we can feed the world when we throw all this food away? Mm-hmm. One third. Yes. Mm-hmm. You see, so I mean, I, I, I don't buy that. You know, I don't buy that. And I've seen that clearly. You know, I've seen you know, in the villages, poor go to the riverside, they set their basket and they will put up the fish and they'll just take what they need and they'll put that basket back into the creek. Mm-hmm. Back into the creek, just what they need to survive off. So there is a way, and we need to learn from those who have been the custodian and they keep us and the preserver of this, of this diversity, we need to go back to them. Because it is they who told us, centuries ago, don't take the oil, don't take the mine, don't cut the trees down. And we ignore that. This is what we now have. So we have to go back to learn from all of that. We have to change the models of investment. We have to change the models of governance. What we have now in no can work. All is done, our current model, it brought more poverty, it brought more disaster, it brought more conflicts, it created massive inequalities and exclusions, it created a wealth gap, only the 1% controlled every single thing, and it's now giving us a global pandemic. So it's never ever work. <sighs> you know, Alfred, you used the word divorce before. We've, I, I, I can speak for my people, uh, that we've been divorced from, from our nature and our, our, our environment for a long, long time. And we are no longer asking, what do I need? We are taught to ask, what do I want? I think that's one of the root causes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I don't know anything about economics. But I'm wondering whether this particular shutdown from COVID-19, how it will disrupt the global supply chain and whether that might have a beneficial effect on (laughs) whether palm oil interests might be significantly affected and other extractive things that are going on. It's for us to see. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of learning going on. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of learning going on. And there are some, there, there, I mean, it's not very conclusive, but there are some indications. I don't want to say trends. There are small snippets of things we're seeing. And if we want to learn, if we also go back and see what's happening. So what, what has this disruption done? Did we believe that there's no way we could have survived with this disruption that we could stay home for a week. <laughs> None of us believe that I could just stay home for one week. If I stay home locked up in my room for a week, in my house for a week, I wouldn't survive. Yeah. Huh? It's a total lie. We can stay <laughs> home for weeks, weeks, and stay survive. So it's a lie. Mm-hmm. So we can stay home and we can reduce footprints. Can we love each other a little bit more? We stay home. Yes, we see how even though we are physically distant, we are connected in a way unimaginable, and we care about each other more than we ever believe. In my neighborhood, I will get up and go to work. I'm I'm busy rushing off to work. I don't have time to even lift up my head and look around and see my neighbors. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm resting, I walk out and all the neighbors are smiling. Hello, how are you? How's the family? Who are asking questions? All of a sudden, people are getting concerned about each other. So something was very wrong about how we lived before in the past. And we're through a lot of lies. They needed to get to work on time, get things done. You need time to stay home. It's changing. So we've seen some snippets. So that also could have implications for the supply chain as well. 
this whole massive supply chain, is this something that people could now start doing more in the world, that countries start getting disconnected? Because yes, I don't talk about globalization, it's implications. But see what that has done. It's showing that globalization is a double-edged sword. It goes both ways. We go in, and because we want to have access to the resources, we destroy communities, we destroy countries, we destroy economies, we destroy religion, we destroy everything, because we want to get the benefits. We are the superior being. Well, it's a food package, my dear. It's a food package. So we destroy forests, we destroy people. Well, what do you have? Well, when climate impact have, the climate change, the, the hurricanes and the floods and the drought and the forest fires, I have no respect of borders. What will cause them is across all countries. When people are moving because they can't survive anymore, no amount of war can stop them. They will come. If you're not happy, it will increase political tensions in your country. It will affect you. When, because of what you're doing, cause pandemic, if a person who eat his bath soup somewhere, well, you are going to get that same bath soup in your, on your table as well. So we are all very connected. So it's a two-edged sword. So it cuts both ways. So it means, like I said before, us sitting now and really rethinking how should we proceed next. So maybe by this disruption, it will also rethink a lot of things. Hopefully, all of this, the people will be in charge of their own decision-making processes. We don't normally rely on governments and big corporations who control them, you know, who are interested in the profits and not in the people and not in the planet. So we've got to rethink all of these things. I think this is where the world needs to go. And I think part of why you folks have started off, we need to continue this dialogue. You know, I hope this is not just maybe, you know, we have this webinar, but we need to do more of this. We need to expand more to other groups. We need to link up to other groups. We who believe in this thing, we who have the same vision, we need to reconnect all across the world, across the world. We need to create ripples across the, across the region because we need to take charge and decide how things are going to go to the next phase of this world. The end of this pandemic, we should never go back to business as usual, but there was never anything called normal. Um, Alfred, I wanted to ask a, a question. I mean, I know deforestation has passed its tipping point a long time ago and it's out of control. But in regard to the indigenous peoples over there and the immediate problems, do you see um, value in, in lobbying for um, indigenous preserves to protect the immediate areas around the villages sure. so people can actually continue to live and like they've always lived and to protect it. So we are currently working on a program that is called Coexist with Nature. And what I was saying, so, you know, sorry, I mean, the, the pandemic came, but part of what we're thinking about is that we work with villagers and indigenous people and say, can we arrange a situation why, where Let's just, like you, for example, if you, you're in the U.S. and you needed to take a holiday, instead of going to the Bahamas or going to Spain or going to France, you go to Liberia or go to the DRC or go to Ghana and go to these villages and spend your tourist dollar with them and stay in the homes of the tribes. And hopefully that money can help them to improve their living conditions. But you stay in the home of the tribes and they educate you about their food. They educate you about their custom. They educate you about their history. Oh, sounds they lovely. They educate you about their farming systems. They educate you about sustainability. And you spend one week or two weeks with the tribe, and you come back, and you are a completely different person. I'm not talking about even the music, their dance, and the drumming. Imagine what value you get out of that. If we were able to innovate that, and we're putting tourist dollar into something like that, that in itself is, can contribute to preserving the forest. Mm, yes. And we are not able to sit down and adapt and support them because we need to pay a fair share of stopping deforestation to where we are now at the tipping point. And each of us can make that contribution by making an active decision. So if we decide that this is what we want to be able to do, and we're going to create thriving communities. So we learn a lot by just by that exchange and, the, and, and this co connection. 
So no one has to come and, 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 and say, okay, we need to bring development. Because now folks will go and stay in the town and the village and the income will improve. You stay actually in the home of people. You're not living in, in big hotels. And you feel that your tourist data is getting in the pockets of the indigenous people. Not getting in the pockets of you know, big businesses who said there are big hotels and big resorts. And you feel that this is something that you're contributing to because you feel that if you put that in it, you have now an alternative model of development. So you can have a big oil brand come and say, well, I'm going to create jobs. You probably have an income. And tourists, can tourists can also destroy an area. I know, but in, if, if you think through it, is, I'm not like, I understand the impact of tourism, but if you think through it and you structure it, you rather want to enable a non-extractive process than getting a massive mining company going and destroying everything. You can organize that. And you can learn from how other countries have done that in a very sustainable way. It's what a design is. It depends on how you're going to design that. If you design more towards an ecological and a more tenuous rice end, then you can, you can succeed. But if you just open it up for just massive influx, then you're going to have a problem. And you can structure that seasonally. So it's not like throughout the year. So you know exactly what time folks will go in and do that. And what is done? And of course, this is how the tribes do things. Everything is seasonal for the tribes. Everything is seasonal for indigenous people. It's not just open ended. Well, a good way to to I think get get money from the tourist trades is to is to uh, target travel organizations that cater to people who who pay the money for uh, unusual, untypical travel experiences you know so like maybe collaborating with organizations um like riverboat cruising companies and um heifer international even could you there could be something where they, an organization can change their model a little bit and work collaboratively collaboratively with um with you yes and, and another thing is that even if we're talking about getting tourists tourists to go in, there are many ways to look at that. So take, for example, are we able to promote a particular indigenous artifacts that they are producing or a particular food item? Let's say there is a snack that these people love doing um, in these communities. Are we able to promote and innovate that? So that, that snack is something that, you know, hotels here in the West or around, we want to put on their menu. And we generate an income. That income will go back to the communities. So, but you, but you do want to protect a a, a a a a a specific area at least to preserve it, so that there's no threat that tourism would damage it in 50 years. You know, you want you you need to instill. I mean, look at what happened to to Hawaii. You know, yeah. that yeah. wasn't that long ago. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, and I, then, then I thought that what I said is going back and listening to the indigenous people and learning from how they done it. So they have a whole land use system layout. If you look at my slide, you saw an older man on the ground. And, you know, he was teaching us. He said, yeah, in this village, here's where we make our farm. Here's where we go and harvest non timber forest products. Here's where we go and pray. This one is con. It's strictly, we call that. They say it's a taboo area. It's a sacred forest. No one carry on any activity there. It's completely off bound, and it's highly regimented. And it's because it's part of the tribe. Folks would not go in that area. It's very sacred. To right. go in that area, you have mm -hmm. to carry on specific ceremonies, specific rituals. So it's completely off guard. So. For, 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 for decades, no one, centuries, it just there. So it was that, if you listen to me earlier, I talked about historical zone, it was in that forest that the chief took me after doing rituals to go and show me the historical zone, how things that evolved over time. And I don't know how many years it was, someone has gone. But because they look at me as a son of the tribe now, based on the work I was doing, like, I want to show you something. He took me in that place. And you wouldn't believe that anyone had been there before. And you go in the place, and that place, I just talk about the trees. 
But it's teamed with wildlife. It's teamed with everything you can think about. As you go in, you see stuff going all over. You see wildlife. You see all the creatures, all, all the, the fauna and flora in this best that you could ever imagine that I've not seen anywhere. So they developed that system. They have it in place. So if we learn from them and we follow that model, we can do that. But what happens is that if we go outside that, because people who are now are just cons- in, uh, thinking only about profits, then we have the problem. When we look at what they're giving us as a commodity to only be turned into profit making, then you, then, then you destroy it. But if you have a system where tourists come and there's, and there's a restriction where the tourists can go, and they can go to the other place, then you know you can preserve that. And you can figure out over time, how do you switch some of that by? You know? So we work with them. And that's one part is getting tourists in. But there are other things that we can, we can definitely do. We can promote their music. We can promote their culture. We can promote their food. Right? We can learn from them. And all of these things it, it allow for generating income. Right? This is a whole sort of stuff we can develop around, around them that will generate income and allow for the preservation of the remaining forest we have. And even expanding that Expanding that, the way they've done that, the whole kind of you know, reforestation, which, 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 which they can do with indigenous species, not monoculture, that they're able to expand upon that. Mm-hmm. So they can, they can do that, but we need to invest into that, go and learn from them and understand it. So, what comes first? I mean, do you? I mean, in this country, the Native Americans are living on preserved land and can control that, what they do on their preserved land. So is it trying to, is it trying to convince your government people on how to look at the land and take care of it? Or is it the indigenous people who should try to take control of the land more so that they can do what they want and they feel is a rightful use of the land. Well, what we've started doing in Liberia is to encourage more indigenous control over their land and resources and work with them to address uh, some of the issues of conservation. You know, let's do them figure out what it is they're doing and how do we learn or how to preserve it. Because, you know, when we talk about conservation and Liberia is an example of when we talk about, you know, set up a conservation and protected areas in the last, uh, 35 years, many conservation organizations have attempted to set up protected areas in Liberia. Mm. Right? So they followed the law, they discussed with the government, they go ahead and, you know, they demarcated areas and they put these water up like a fortress and said, it's a protected area. But a protected area is in the lands of indigenous people. So you war them, you build a whole fortress. People were moving around just to connect to other tribes. They can't go there anymore. And sometimes setting up protected areas almost become like an destructive process where there's no travel zones and people are arise, people are threatened, where you need to go in and have us the dry wood, you can go in. Or go access some of the uh, 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 the bush meat that people live up, you can have that. Or go do gatherings, you can go have us honey, you can go for our snails. It's completely command and control. It self creates a threat and people don't feel in ownership of that process. So then that undermines the protection of the area. So they set up these things across the country and they have not been able to manage it correctly. We are now working on a proposal to get some funding to set up what we call community driven, community driven protected areas. Where first and foremost, we address the whole question of rights of indigenous people. We will secure that land. So they feel that they have rights and ownership over the land. Then we'll work with them to develop a system based on their, 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 their custom and tradition to be able to preserve and manage that. Then they have ownership of it. Then they have control over it. Then mm-hmm. they have management of it. So this is the sort of model we want to do, which is based on what I talked about, the whole concept of, of uh, coexisting with, with, with nature. And what you said, develop a number of management land use system across that. Strictly uh, protected based on the whole question. This is a sacred forest, multiple use, and area where there's production unit where they can do their farms. So you can come and see and area where they're able to bring other people to come and showcase this thing. So we are having this conversation now with my colleagues to develop mm-hmm. that system. So we allow for that to happen. 
Because we believe that if we showcase that, mm. it's on a right-based approach. People can change what's going on around the country, how people look at forests much more. Because we are now putting those who own the forest and those who have been keepers of the forest in charge of managing the forest. Because what's going to happen? You have someone who lives in, in the city who has an NGO or the government who is not even from that region. They only go there, you know, because they want to go and regulate. If you are able to put those who live in the forest in charge of it, the farmers who are there, the gatherers who are there, the keepers who are there, the women who every single day go in and, and, and try to have a medicinal plant and manage the resources, if you're able to empower them as manager of that resource, that will help. So we're building that process into place and we hope that we can use that as a demonstration site. But, and that's the part I was also thinking about, is trying to get in what we call a, a, a rice a conservation radio program. So we have a radio program that first and foremost, that is who are able to to share, develop content specific to their tribes, that they are the ones who are in charge of the radio station. They can send messages and they can share uh, how they are able to protect their forest. So part of what we're doing is identify, you know, where can we get a transmitter? So currently I'm looking around to folks who may have access to anyone who has, you know, like a used transmitter that we can be able to find a way and get in. So we can put that in a hard of reference. We don't have access to the sort of media, but if you have a radio station, like an FM radio station, well, I to send their messages all over of how do you preserve, how do you protect, how do you manage these, these places. And they are able to easily communicate with each other. So we're hoping that uh, getting a radio station could be the heart of that process to allow them to preserve that forest much more. So mm -hmm. I'm not asking for anyone who know has you know, an FM transmitter or the shortwave transmitter that they're able to donate. It will be really good. And uh, maybe we can find the, the means to get it installed into the forest area that the locals themselves are not able to have. Because by communicating, by sharing information uh, across uh, different communities in, in the much larger distances, you can now contribute more to a piece of the Because if you saw an extractive person coming or you saw a poster coming to your forest, you can make an announcement on the radio. You can easily transmit that to other people. The tribes can now go and talk about how they manage your forest and they can share experiences here and there. So are, are you you talking about a shortwave radio or something? Shortwave radio and FM radio will be very helpful. Anyone who has that transmitter will be very helpful. Either a shortwave transmitter or an FM transmitter. Ah. So can, you do, can you do GoFundMe campaign or something in that regard? Maybe <laughs> like, I haven't thought about that. I don't know how to set that up. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, that's it. I'm You'd the, probably the, get very far with that, yeah. Or we want to set up what we call conservation radios, so people are able to use the radio to conserve and protect their forests, mm. which is going to be owned by the tribes themselves. Because currently they have no control over communication and media. It's very much controlled by the government and other private actors. So to empower people, you need to give them the voice. Yeah. Giving them the voice means they have to be in charge of communication. To have to their own radio and their own content materials. Does that radio station exist, Alfred, or are you talking about something that is being planned? It's being planned. It doesn't it, 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 it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to group together that way. You need tools to become yeah. a stronger unit. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Alfred, wow. can you share your uh, email with us? In case we have any ideas. Sure. Let me put it in the chat. I think this has been very informative and very, very helpful, a little bit uh, depressing, but very, uh, very helpful. And uh, I think we should all, um, maybe through biodiversity, try to stay together and figure out what, uh, how we can help. Thank you, John. Thank you. Alfred, thank you for your time. This was just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It was. Yeah, thank you all. Good. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Inspiration. I think, I think this is to be continued. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alfred. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the help. The inspiration. Bye bye. Okay.
We need his email. We need the email. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Be well. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. I have my love. It's in the year. I'm a year and I have my cumulus. Perfect. Okay. Paula, do you have his email? I do. I've got it. Alpha, do you want people to have Northeastern or the other one? I mean, anyone. I, anyone? I'm okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Very good. Thank okay. you so much. I appreciate it. It ah. would be hard to do a GoFundMe for that radio he wants. Yeah. That would be <laughs> Well, how many radios are you talking about? I mean, I mean, we can start with one or two, you know, across, and initially we can expand it across the whole forest area. Yeah, I think how, how how far do they need to reach? Um, you know, I'm not a broadcaster. I have no idea. I'm going to talk to an expert and figure out how, what the range is. But you know, um, if it can, if one student can cover the entire thing, I don't know how many kilometers or stuff it would go. Then it would be good. But I just want to make sure that it cover the entire forest zone. Because our bread is unique, we have two major forest zones. We have one which is very unique, it's evergreen in the southeastern part of the country. Then there's one in the northwestern part which is deciduous. Uh -huh. It's very unique across the region, yes. So, and it, it's divided in the middle where the capital city is Monrovia. So there's a division, huh. it's very fragmented, but these two zones are kept apart. But it's also a link to forest corridors where these livestock, I mean, uh, these wildlife and others are able to move back and forth. Alpha, can I ask you, 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 you do speaking at Northeastern and they have a great, they're known for their internship programs. They're oh, well yes. known for so I, I, have, I do have interns. I do have student interns. I, I teach and I do co-op. In fact, I run co-op and some of the issues yeah. are what we talk about with my students. Yeah. And at you as well, I'm at you. So in fact, this summer, some of the internship is, 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 is around how we can provide support, not just to my colleague in Liberia. Remember I said, we are spending this network across the region. So to support you know, the communities and support the lawyers across the region. The mm -hmm. thing though is that most of the internship I get uh, are, are, from, uh, are from law students and they are interested more in legal issues. So if, they were, if I'm able to get internship from other colleges, like you know, pull from the School of Anthropology, well, I was just thinking from the aspect of, I know my son was involved with um, another guy. My son went to Northeastern uh, where they went to um, a village out in India and brought out independent um, educational computers. And they transported them actually on the plane and all. And if you come at the co-op from the perspective of, of the, the um, engineering kind of you know perspective i think that there'd be a lot of interest sure um you know um uh, when was it um the, uh, during the fall i was involved in some work with uh the engineering the minute from the architectural division and we're doing some work on how you know do you build sustainable uh housing linked to indigenous people and i actually gave yeah. it into a class you know but i was not involved in the co-op there was a promise for me to come back yeah. so we could have developed that process. But then, you know, it didn't work out. And then I got a placement now at Yale. So I'm two days on Northeastern and I'm yeah. two in uh, New Haven at, at Yale. So I'm between the two, but I'm very much open up uh, to these possibilities to be able to support it. Because I figure out that for the time I've been here, I've been able to generate a lot more support to empower people. So these different meetings are important for me. To generate so if you collaborate with somebody in the international politics department and some other department, it sounds like you need to collaborate in order to sort of get a co-op going that would actually work over there. Because you don't just need engineer people who can manage the technology. You need people who can communicate and, and within the, the villages. Yeah. And um, they have to, you see what I'm saying? So I, I think it would that. be easier for you because you can't be doing it all yourself. I agree. You need, yeah. Trying to find those people is, is, is what I need to work on. 
Yeah. Instead of and figure out who's interested in this issue, maybe develop like. A yeah. So of, just get a, a meeting together with some department heads over there and just. Are you a novice in yourself? Just, 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 just. What do you call it? Do a brain brain dump on your ideas. Brainstorming. Yeah. Brainstorming. You, Thank you. Brainstorming. <laughs> Are you a novice to yourself, Wendy? What? Yeah. Are you? Are you? Are you a novice? What? Are you at Northeastern University? I am not at Northeastern. I know it because my son went there, so he went through the. He had a few co-ops. Yeah. And he and he and uh, yeah. And he was over in India, and um, it, it can be a complicated affair, and it but. But they're they they pry they pry they prize themselves on their co-op. So there's a huge interest in getting more going. So your son might know the names of some of the right people for him to contact. I he might. So That's what he's looking for. I have for your here. yeah. I have your information. So I, I I'm going to talk to my son and some of his friends, and we could see if there could be get on the treadmill. Yeah, excellent. Yeah? Thank you. This is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And then every village has a receiver. Be awesome. Yes, every village has a receiver. That's true. And um, what could happen also is that um, you know you have these receivers and people are able to you know reach out. Have you contacted MIT? Because you know it sounds funny, but my son has gotten tons of equipment through F MIT, um, and. It is an avenue to put 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 your name out there that um, I haven't, of what you're I looking for. I haven't contacted them, but I've I've been invited there two times to speak. I spoke to MIT Do it. Um, around land issues and developing an index, but um, I have not able to develop any traction. Maybe I I went to the run spoke to the run folks, so maybe it's good to talk to more of the engineering. Those involved in the vision, because I spoke to folks who are doing something around social science. Yes, because yeah, because you have a multi-dimensional issue here. Yeah, you know, so it's yeah. good to, and you're you're sitting in an area that that might have all all your it's technological just, answers. So that's true. So I need to uh, to really get up after this, uh, you know, stuff, and you know, start looking around. Maybe even I'm at the sitting room find information and write to folks and so this is uh, assistance and support well that that's great well um for myself i have your information and i'll i'll, I'll see if i can get feedback from my son okay thank you yeah all right yeah thank you so thank you so much any last questions or any last thing you want to say alfred well um any question for us? If there are no questions, I just want to say thank you, Paula. You know, from the time I met you at that um, uh, protest, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from the youth climate strike yes. to this, to this presentation. Well. Yes. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, um, this will be the network to support the work we're doing, not just in Liberia, but, you know, in other areas. Um, you know, supporting communities and indigenous people to protect the forest and address the issues that all of us are faced with. So I hope this community can mobilize around that effort and we all can see that we all have a responsibility to push back what's going on around the world by helping people who are on the front line. So I just hope that this will be that support system. And um, I'm available anytime if anyone is, you know, need me to provide more clarity on anything, yes, get in touch with me and I'm able to do that. If we can build this support network and we can all reach out collectively, that's how we can begin to solve the problem. It's easier to listen to this thing and go back. But if we set up a network and say, okay, we now listen to our friend, we think we can do something about this and we build around like a support system. And we start looking at and figure out what do you need? First is that I'm able to send you guys maybe a concept note just laying out what I think would be helpful to support in, in the of that concern, we can each of us can figure out okay. what can we do to follow up on different things and we all can take responsibilities. And nothing is too small to do. Even a phone call, even a text message, even a follow up, even a link to say, have you talked to this person? 
like what Mende just said, I'm going to talk to my student. That's all we might need. We don't need anyone's like, I'm not asking for donations, you know, give money, give this, give that. Just the connection, just the networking, you know, trying to get all this going forward could be extremely helpful to resolve these things. It will be very helpful. And that's why I'm asking for to be the support system. So for agree that they want to organize and mobilize around this effort to support people who are being threatened because of the land and resources, I'll be very helpful to do that. So thank you so much again for the opportunity. It's really been a pleasure with all the questions. I've learned a lot from all these questions and I'm happy that we're able to be and meet new friends as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay.